Welcome to the Running For Real podcast, where each week we bring you a conversation designed to help you create positive change in your life, community and planet. It's a collective of conversations about running, the climate emergency and social justice. Running For Real is for the brave, for those with courage and vulnerability. United by our love of running, we're driving momentum towards some of the really tough challenges we're facing as humanity. So come join me, Tina Muir, and let's get started. Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining me today on the Running For Your Podcast. If you are a first time listener, you picked quite a day to join me. Um, If you have been listening all along, thank you for coming back. Welcome back. Uh, Today is actually my birthday as you are listening to this. Uh, And so I was wondering before we get going on this, if you could do me a birthday, a birthday favor, if you could do me a favor on my birthday, um, which is to go to your favorite podcast player and leave a rating and review or just subscribe to the show. Yep, I know that's pretty simple, um, but uh, that will mean that I can uh, make sure that I can keep you updated. You can get those together runs that come out on Monday. You can get these regular episodes. So by leaving a rating and or review, even if you've done one already, um, you will reset your review or come to the top. That really helps. And subscribing. That's the one thing I ask for you for my birthday is you can go do that for me. So thank you so much for doing that. I'm excited today to introduce you to our guest, who is Verna Volker. She is the founder of Native Women Running, the community that you probably have seen on Instagram. She also has started plenty of other things within the community, um, including Native Women's Wilderness, which is a gathering to share stories, learn and support other Native women. Uh, so you can be featured on there if you are a native woman. Um, she is someone who is really inspiring within the community. She's gained a lot of interest, um, just for the way that she speaks out and stands up and just, you'll hear a lot today about how her vulnerability is really what leads her. Um, and it's what makes her so appealing to so many, including myself. So I'm excited to introduce you to Verna. So we will just take a moment to thank one of our sponsors and be right to that episode. Thank you to Tracksmith for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I I just don't know what else positive I could say about Tracksmith. I, I just adore them. Um, I recently had the event with Mary, which you got to hear um, in with Tracksmith, where we had a live event. They hosted, they rented out this house. We had a day where they grilled and it was just this big community event. And I, it was one of my favorite running days of my life. It really was very special and it was all down to Tracksmith bringing that all together. I also got to check out their Run Cannonball series, which is genius idea of making um, the running clothes in this series uh, products that can go that can go swimming that are both swimwear and running wear so you can use them for both so if you're going on a trip to the beach I mean perfect right but even if not if it's just running through sprinklers it dries quickly it is just a great product to be trying and I love the colors and the styles that they have going there they also have their strata uh, tanks some singlets some shorts all those things are going to be very quick dry if you do have a summer run and then you have to jump into a car and we all know how that stinky wet clothes um, that we can put in stuff in our suitcase or in our bag post run can really really start to stink everything out so let's avoid that by getting yourself some of those products i as always love the session speed shorts um, and there are many items on there they're always changing their styles and many of you keep saying that you see things i'm wearing and you want to get one of those but you've got to act fast because tracksmith changes their inventory quick so be on top of that Now you can go to tracksmith.com and use code TINA15 to get yourself $15 off your order of $75 or more. There is so much there that you can love. There's also the journal you can go check out, their lookbooks, their film stories. You can learn about their programs, Hair AC, the fellowship, 
the athletes they are supporting. And by the way, they had five Olympians come out of the Olympic trials, which was pretty amazing. Tracksmith is just a brand I feel so positively about. You can go to tracksmith.com and use code TINA15 for $15 off your order of $75 or more. Verna, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running Career podcast. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you and I'm excited for my audience to get to know you. Um, I've admired you for a while with the way that you approach the world, your honesty, your realness, your being able to just the vulnerability show um, by, you know, admitting that sometimes when you work with a brand, you, you're kind of like, oh, there's those sorts of why why did they pick me or why do they want to work with me? Or, um, right. also just the struggles you go through physically. And I think we right. need more and more of that in, uh, in these times, I suppose, while, um, <laughs> there's so much of people just saying, look how great things are. Now right. I'm curious with you, have you always been pretty good at being vulnerable and sharing how things are really going or is that something you've had to work on over the years? It's, I've had to work on it. I think just through, A lot of things growing up, you just didn't talk about things. You didn't kept everything inside and being Mm -hmm. a native person, um, uh, you just don't talk about things. And so I think it's just taken a couple years, especially being a mother and my husband, just being able to be able just to show that. And I think when I show that people tend to respond to that. And that's what I really try to do because I want people to feel like, hey, I get it. Or I understand, you know, maybe running is hard or uh, I feel this way that people will just see that I'm actually a real person because on Instagram, it's sometimes hard to, you want to hide that. Everything seems picture perfect sometimes, but I think people respond when you just are in that situation and you're real and honest about life. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a fine line to find, fine line to find. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Because you know, we, I find the same thing that when I'm vulnerable and say about something tough, it tends to do get a lot of reaction and people really appreciating it. But then we also don't want to just be like negative Nancy's Mm -hmm. who are like, this is wrong with the world and that's wrong with the world. And we want to keep things like positive. Um, but we also want to be able to say things are tough. Um, and that's okay. And also say something good happened to me. And I feel sometimes we're even afraid of that too, of being able to say like, Hey, I did this and I earned this rather than being like, sometimes it can feel even uncomfortable to share something you're really proud of because you think people will roll their eyes at you. Do you ever experience that? You know, on my Instagram last night, I shared about how, you know, I'm a Koga global ambassador And we had an event and yesterday we had a Zoom meeting, a Zoom call, and I was with all these Hoka people and they're like, Verna, you're part of the Hoka family. Mm. And that really just hit me that I was actually part of the Hoka family. And so I shared that on my Instagram stories, how that really meant a lot to me to feel like I was part of that. And sometimes I say I don't deserve it, but then I have to take a step back and say, I do deserve that Mm. because I've worked hard to be where I'm at. And maybe not everybody agrees with that, but you know who you are and you have to be true to yourself. And I'm just learning how to embrace this whole new, uh, this, I guess, global ambassador and the opportunities that I have with Hoka. Uh, I don't want to, oh, I don't want to come across as arrogant or like, uh, well, I'm doing this. And so I always share with my followers, I'm so thankful and I'm humble at these opportunities. And I always clearly say that every time. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I'm excited about it. And mm-hmm. I just know people will direct message me and say, you earn this, you should mm-hmm. be happy. And so I really have to embrace that. And I think it's just one of those things that you learn uh, cause you know, I grew up with a really hard childhood and sometimes you think I don't deserve this or this, this is not me. This should not be me. They shouldn't choose me. And it's all going back to just learning how to cope with that, learning how to heal and just taking it on and being proud of who you are. Mm -hmm. I also do think it's partly a woman thing as well. I feel like obviously this doesn't apply across the board to all women and all men, but, um, I do feel that women have a lot more time owning 
like what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. uh, and particularly because as in the past, we've seen a lot of examples of women not wanting to raise one another up because seeing right. it, you know, it, and it's sad that that was the case, but it was the environment that women were in, in that if one woman was moving on up in the world, then she was pushing other women out the way because there was only space for so many women. Um, but right. obviously that conversation is now changing with mm-hmm. a lot of unlimited opportunities. And you obviously understand this from a native perspective as well. Right. Um, and there's all kinds of different intersections there that we could, we could discuss with that. And I, but I'd love you, you mentioned there about, uh, about family and obviously, um, you know, community does mean a lot to you, um, Mm -hmm. in general, um, as a native person. So I'd love, uh, for you to talk about, uh, even with that said, with the past 18 months we've had, have you learned more about community that you didn't, uh, think about before? I think so. Um, you know, native people were not, I think for me, my husband, you know, he's non-native. And so I've learned that like non-native people, it's like, you have your little circle of family, you know, it's like mom and dad, your siblings, whereas for na- native people, it's like everybody around mm-hmm. them. And that could be for any culture too. But, um, I think just with native woman running, um, it's been a virtual community since it started. And I think it's just with everything when COVID happened, I was happy that it was a, it was a virtual community because, People came together in a different way that just uh, brought us together, even though we're not specifically in person. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned a lot that people do truly take on that community and that it's a it's built up in a way that people feel like they're part of that wherever they are across the world having that community. So I think it's just brought people closer together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that. And and while there is a lot of division right now, mm-hmm. um, I do think people have realized the importance of collectiveness and, and relying on more than just your, like you said, small individual unit right. um, and thinking about uh, a relationship beyond that. And do you have any thoughts for how we tap into that more, um, especially as things start to you know, return and, and reopen? How do we keep a hold of that um, ability to to lean on each other, even if that isn't in person, um, as we move forward and not get back into the hustle and bustle of, I'm just right. out for me? I, I think it's just like for me being a leader, and I think leadership is important in that way, uh, just keeping that going, keeping that. I think when you are in a leader in the position that I'm at, it's my responsibility to bring people together and to keep that. Um, And so it could be a variety of things of just encouraging each other and having a mission or something that you are, uh, uh, that happens, for instance, things that we have to, you know, in the, in things happening in the recent news with, you know, indigenous children, that just really shows me that, uh, there is community and calling to action. Hey, we need to run together. We need to encourage each other. I think you have to constantly do that because uh, you want to keep that positivity as a leader. And I've never been in a leadership position because I ne- actually never thought I would be in a leadership position in my life. And um, so I think just you have to build that up constantly. Mm. And um, somehow people just kind of are drawn to that. And I'm thankful for that because sometimes I don't do much and people do seem to want that community. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that just really shows me that, okay, I'm doing something right in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I think the community definitely recognizes that you're, you're recognized and celebrated maybe as not as much as you should be, but yeah, moving in a positive direction (laughs) and, uh, and people are appreciating that. And I want to talk, in a minute about what you mentioned there about, um, you know, running for indigenous, uh, children in Canada. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wanted to just say before that, that with this interview, um, there's been other podcasts that you've been on. Um, you've been on grounded with, um, Danae, you've been Mm -hmm. on, um, see Tolly run with Carrie. So if people want to dive into the, uh, 
more of your like upbringing story and the history, then we'll go there. But today I want to just talk about some other things beyond that and more of the life lessons that you live by and the way that you mm. approach the world, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, before we go into some of the deeper stuff, I want to just talk about something which I think really applies to everyone listening in that you have talked a lot about having, and let me see if I can say this correct, uh, chronic monoarticular inflammatory <laughs> arthritis, oh, um, yes. which is a problem primarily in your knee from what I yes. see. Um, and you talked about how sometimes it's tough to stay positive. And we've already touched on this okay. a little bit, but you try and keep that appreciation of th- being thankful. Right. Now, many people will resonate with that of, of recognizing that they need to stay positive but, and letting themselves ride the emotions. But sometimes you actually almost <laughs> want to feel sorry for yourself, right? Because you oh. want to like dwell in it and, and yes. lap up some sympathy, even though you know that's not going to help. So how do you let yourself oh. go through the experience and and still come back to that gratitude? You know, I just it recently actually, you know, before I did that post, uh, I think previously a couple of days before that, I was just feeling sorry for myself because I'm, you know, I'm running this 100K um Halloween weekend. And that's a lot of mileage. And my knee, I mean, I'm starting these infusions and uh, I just started the first one and tomorrow I have my second one. And you just want that to kick in so that you won't have to deal with it. And I did a long 19 miler on Saturday on trails and it was hurting, but I kept doing it. And maybe that wasn't a good idea, but you know, my doctor gave me other medicine just to kind of supplement to help me uh, uh, just to help me through it when, so that the, the infusions, once I keep going, it'll start working. Um, you know, and I think it's just one of those things where it's okay to have a couple hours or even a day to cry about it. And, um, I think just having my husband has been really good because he knows how much I love running and he just, he wants to take that pain away. But I think just having that moment of it's okay to feel sorry for yourself. It's okay to cry. Once you get past that, it's just, (laughs) it's messy. Somehow you come out of gratitude. And I think just with my upbringing, um, my family's always been, we've been through a lot just with Mm -hmm. like our family and trauma that somehow you find your way out of that and you find gratitude and and so I just try to share that as much and just being thankful for those, that little, the little runs or those little accomplishments, mm-hmm. uh, it's always important to me, whether it's maybe like today I ran a 10 miler and I was happy about that. But yeah. <laughs> getting up and doing what you can is just a celebration. And so I take every every, because of my pain and it will subside eventually, I just rejoice in those things that are hard and just just take that. And it's hard. I mean, I'm not any way perfect. There's days when it's horrible and I'm just like, I'm never going to do this. I can't do this. And, Mm. uh, I just have to trust the doctors. I have to trust my coach and just trust that they are doing what's right for me. Mm. And I can't control everything. (laughs) So true. Runners want to do that for sure. It doesn't work. (laughs) Um, and then beyond that, you have also spoken in the past about being about uh, not feeling like a natural runner. Now yes. I hear this from people all the time. Um, <laughs> so many people listening will know that too. So tell us, you know, why you feel that way, and of course, uh, like what, if anything, would make you feel different about that. You know, I did not grow up running, and as you know, many Native Indigenous runners have run since they were little. And I was never one of those runners. I didn't start till I was in the midst of motherhood about like 12 years ago. And so I see oftentimes when you're on social media, that comparison, like, oh, it looks, that just looks so easy for them. And there are natural runners. And there's a lot of, I know followers that I know who can just run these amazing miles. And I really have to just think about my own journey. And sometimes I will post on Instagram is just to embrace your journey, whether you started just a couple years ago or, you know, later in life, because I started later in life and learning to just take that on. And it's not easy. And 
So I think for me, it's just one of those things where I have to do that. Um, and, and sometimes people will say, I wasn't, na- I'm not a natural runner. It take like, especially people who I think are really natural mm-hmm. runners, they say, no, mm-hmm. it took me a long time or I didn't start running till I was later, but uh, later in life. But I, I don't know. I, I think every time I feel that way, I, I realize I look back on my journey and I think about how far I've come mm-hmm. and the things that I've accomplished. And that just brings me joy and saying, you know, I might not be the natural runner, but I'm doing something and somehow it's working. Mm -hmm. So it's such a (laughs) process. This running thing is such a process. They always say life is like running, you know, like a race. And it is true. Absolutely. Ups and downs. Yeah, absolutely. Although I would like to challenge you and my (laughs) listeners know this in the natural runner thing. I do not doubt the fact that, you know, there are some runners out there who just clearly have a gift where they can just, you know, basically do nothing and yet somehow run very fast. Right. However, as you mentioned, I think a lot of the time we might compare ourselves to someone, or if I'm honest, people would compare themselves to me. Um, Mm -hmm. But as with everything, we never see what's going on beneath the surface. So I swam for many years as a preteen that built up my lungs Mm -hmm. that then gave me the ability to go into running somewhat fit, uh, aerobically. And then that translated to running, which allowed me to run more and run faster. And so I think, you know, that's a good example of where someone might say, Oh, she's a natural, but actually it was the swimming that kicked it off. And yes, obviously there are degrees of talent. There's a continuum of what our ability, what our ceiling is. Um, but I just wanted to mention there that I think a lot of people do look at it that way and feel, you know, um, maybe it's a motivation thing. Like I'm going against the odds and if that helps, that's great. Keep that up. Um, but if it's a case of, uh, like a thing that you or others might put themselves down and think Mm -hmm. I'm always trying to battle because I'm not meant to do this. Um, I just, and I'm not necessarily saying this about you, but I do worry with people listening that they might you know, something goes wrong. Someone, the doctor says you're just not meant to be a runner and the doctor doesn't know what they're talking about. But because that narrative has been in that person's brain the whole time they've been running, they listen and they stop. When really it's just an injury that would have eventually subsided. Right. So yeah, there's no real point that I just wanted to, or no real question out that. I just wanted to like bring that up because I think so many people feel that way. And yeah, as we've said, social media does not help with that whatsoever. No. No, in fact, it makes it worse. It does, you know, cause like, for instance, uh, sometimes I don't feel like an ultra runner, even though I've ran a 50 miler. Yeah, so tell the listeners when you say <laughs> that I'm not a natural runner, what you have done. So, you know, I've gone from like a non-runner to like an ultra 50 and now I'm, you know, training for a 60, a hundred K, which is like roughly 62 miles. Uh, and sometimes I live in here in the Midwest, of course, I don't have the mountains, But I always have this perception that people think ultra runners are those ones who are running in Colorado, who are running, uh, you know, vertical. They're like doing these, you know, up these mountains. And I look at those and I'm like, "Mm, why do I not feel like an ultra runner? And someone reminded me through a direct message just recently. It is ultra running and ultra runners are not made Mm -hmm. in certain places. It is made where you are. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't take mountains or things to make you an ultra runner. Mm -hmm. And so that was a good reminder that that it's not about climbing mountains. It's about endurance. It's about that, uh, though, I wish, you know, I I could see the benefits of running on actual mountains instead of a treadmill incline. (laughs) So, you know, and so that's just what you have to do to 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 conquer that Mm -hmm. to just to change your mindset and that. So that was a good reminder from a seasoned ultra runner telling me that through direct message. Thank you to you, Ken, for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. And friends, I have an exciting announcement for you. 
as you know, I have been uh, using UCAN for many years. I believe 2013, maybe 14 was the first year I used UCAN, which is crazy to think about. I loved it immediately. Um, I've been carrying it with me in my races. I carried it in my trail marathon with me, carried it in Boston when I ran Boston in 2019. Um, I have been basically making my own gels, a very concentrated solution that I carry around with me um, in my races. And many of you said, you know, that's all well and good that you carry it in your hands, but, you know, uh, is, there a, is there a gel option? And at the time there wasn't, but I'm excited to tell you that you can now has a gel option. You can edge energy. Um, represents this big leap in how athletes are going to be fueling for sport. It is the first and only on the go training fuel powered by super starch. Edge is going to put you in this ideal performance state by keeping your blood sugar stable so you can work smarter and harder. It's the next generation of sports fuel. I have been using or making my own version of this for years. It is a really great way to take things down. And it's just so cool now that you can get that 15 grams of super starch energy um, in an easy packet that you can take with you on your runs if you don't want to be carrying bottles like I had been. Um, you will see that all their elite athletes are now using it. And there's a lot of really great reviews. Now, that said, I've mentioned many times I'm not particularly an orange fan in anything, really. Um, so, um, I am excited to be trying out the new flavors. There's nothing against the, the, the flavor itself. Um, you will see there are plenty of good reviews, people saying it tastes like orange, orange creamsicle, but I'm just not an orange person. And you know that I like to be honest. So I just wanted to tell you that, but you should go to youcan.co and use code Tina. You can, that's code Tina. You can for 20% off your order. It is very popular going down really well if you have been thinking about giving you can a try but the fact there isn't a gel has put you off now is the time to go try it out and if you're planning on racing a marathon in the fall you better be trying it out now because you want to get started to make sure that you know what your plan is going to be when the races are finally available go to youcan.co and use code tina you can for 20 percent off your order I could see the benefits of running on actual mountains instead of a treadmill incline. <laughs> so, you know, and so that's just what you have to do to, to, to conquer that, mm -hmm. to just, to change your mindset and that. So that was a good reminder from a seasoned ultra runner telling me that through a direct yeah. message. But it's also a good example of where a minute ago we were talking about you feeling like you're not a natural runner Well, some other person who feels that way sees that you have run exactly. 50 miles and says, wait a minute, I could never do that. Right. So she's saying she's not a natural runner. So what am I? <laughs> so, um, I'm exactly. going to challenge you to, to remove that narrative from your brain as much exactly. as you can. Um, because you know how it feels when someone else makes you feel that way. Exactly. And, uh, so I think you need a bit more confidence there. Yes. Um, <laughs> and actually it reminded me, do you know who Corey Waltering is? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I had him on the podcast a few months ago and he was saying that, and he's also done a, a film about this, I believe, um, his most passionate thing, um, that he wants to change is, um, uh, so he lives in oh, Utah, right? No, he lives um, in like, uh, he, maybe like Ohio mm. or somewhere in the Midwest, somewhere in the Midwest. Okay. And he said, you know, he doesn't want to, um, advocate and be an activist uh, as a black man who's a ultra runner. He doesn't want to be an advocate or an activist for being a gay man. That's a runner. Mm -hmm. He wants to be an activist for Midwest runners to say <laughs> that, um, Midwest runners can be, uh, just as successful, exactly what you're saying as, um, runners from anywhere else. So he pretty exactly. much just says the same thing as you. So it's quite, you're not oh, the only one thinking nice that. Now yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that's pretty funny. Um, and then along the same lines, let's just keep going down this path. Um, I read something that you wrote saying, I know I can never compete with what the world sees as a runner, the homogenous mm -hmm. runner that fits the model runner, white, blonde, right. thin, fit, etc. All types yeah. of runners have, should be seen. That's why, that's why I'm here to change the narrative. Right. Um, and while you're absolutely right. And, uh, 
as someone who probably fits that mold of the homogenous runner, other than maybe the blonde section, um, <laughs> I, I can definitely see that. Do you have, do you feel hope that things will change to where that isn't the default? Yes. Yes. Okay. I definitely see it more. Um, I don't know if you know, but I'm part of running diversity and I do. Yeah. and, uh, the, and it's nice because we uh, have had, it's been almost a year since we've been together. And sometimes I just think it's my perspective, but the reason why I started Native Woman Running was because of that, mm -hmm. because I was Absolutely. doing my research on running apparel, running magazines, books, podcasts, and it was just that type. And I think it is changing. And I think for me, it was one of those things where I was like, I can't let, and I can't wait around. Like, I'm not going to wait for this. Like, I felt like I had to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And then when, and I think for me, it's more of just sharing that story and see other people of uh, the industry seeking out in Native runners. And oftentimes as Native women, we have so much uh, against us. We were often overly sexualized in costumes and mascots. And when people often think about us, they think about, Pocahontas and they mm -hmm. think about, you know, wow, you know, the, the sexy costumes and things like that. And so I wanted to, to make a, a difference where people were seeing native women in a positive light, that mm -hmm. we are matriarchs, that we are leaders in our families, that we are successful. I have a lot of women who are running, who are ultras, who've ran Boston and basically just sharing these stories. And I think it is changing because I, I see it slowly and i think it's taking its time and um having people like me wanting to do something about it make those changes and oftentimes i always say i don't speak for all native people or all native women runners native women runners who are very good runners maybe they've always never felt that way but you know i always say that i don't speak for all native women runners but uh i think just being part of like running diversity and the things that we're changing is making a difference, not just only with indigenous runners, but even with our, with, you know, the black runners, you know, black women runners and um, all those types of runners are, we want to change that. And because uh, I think for us, it's more of an impact of what we want our children to, to be part of that. that my little girl who's eight will see herself someday in a magazine or see herself someone like, oh, wow, you know, like she sees me doing this work and she's so proud of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy because then that's paving the way for her. And, mm -hmm. you know, Allison Desir, you know, we talk a lot and, you know, she does, she does it for her little guy. Yeah. You know, and so Glory. that motivates, motivates us to do this. And Martha Garcia has a, a little girl too, who's like eight or seven and just changing that and, um, so that's just kind of our motivation Absolutely. of the work that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it is clear to see and that I, that's good to hear that you feel that it's not going to be the default someday. I mean, it's long overdue, but, um, we're working towards it. And do you think your running journey would have been different? Had you seen someone like you? Yes, I think so. How, how would you, what do you anticipate that would have uh, or, you know, looking through your kid's eyes, uh, yeah. What do you, you know, you've said that, uh, your daughter's proud of you. Um, what do you see with, uh, how things would have been different? I think just a more of a motivation. Mm. Maybe I would have seen other, you know, cause we have a native people who, you know, I don't the one of the famous runners for instance is Billy Mills, you know, yes. he's very popular, uh, but he's, it's very far and few. And so, uh, to have someone, I think everyone needs a role model. And I think if I had that, I, I would probably have started running <laughs> earlier in my journey. I'm not sure. But, um, and I think that's just important because we just need that more positive role models in our lives. And I think that would have been uh, just wonderful for me to see. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I think that it's making an impact now and hopefully for my daughter or even my three boys that they'll see that. And I'm excited for what the future holds for them. So do you remember anything as a child of thinking I can't run or is it just kind of, you don't have any, it was so not even thought about that you just 
don't have any memories of of running or runners? I don't. I don't. Uh, I mean, I had a few siblings, but you know, it's it's one of those things where life was pretty hard. Yeah. Life was tough. You know, we. Yeah. I grew up in alcoholism yeah. home. My father passed. Uh, when I was three, um, you know, we live in poverty. We didn't have the opportunities that maybe many people had. And so it was almost like it was survival mode. Like if we didn't have a certain money for things, it was just like, we just didn't do it. Or maybe I just didn't know better because this is just the life that I had. Mm -hmm. But people have always asked me like growing up, how, you know, what was it like growing up? I mean, I just remember running through the canyons, the sagebrush, things like that. That's why I really love nature. And so, yeah, we just didn't have those opportunities. And then I think later in life, you know, I played sports and sports was so different back then than it is today. It's so much more competitive and it's more costly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just remember Okay, sign up for basketball. And it's yeah. like, you didn't have to pay any fees. <laughs> you yeah. know? So now it's like having high schoolers are like, wow, you got to pay for that and this and this. And so um, I think it was just not having that privilege. Uh, and I didn't know any better mm -hmm. until I look back at my life now as an adult and seeing, wow, we didn't have much. So yeah. yeah. And how do you, how, and I'm asking this as more of like from a parent perspective with a one-year-old and a three-year-old, I'm not yeah. there yet. Um, <laughs> how do you not have things that maybe impacted you or lodged in your brain of, of things that either happened to you or things that your parents struggled with uh, and not pass them down? Like, is do you do mm -hmm. a lot of work internally yourself to try and, yeah, like break mm -hmm. that, um, what do they call like? Cycle uh, gen or, generational cycle. Yeah, oh, of like, yeah. 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 You know, I think for me, it's, um, for instance, my mother, I mean, you kind of learn through your life to be uh, forgiving and empathetic. I mean, my mother was going through a lot. I mean, you know, back then, you know, if you had postpartum, you didn't talk about stuff like yeah. that. She lost her husband and uh, we lost like some siblings. And so mm -hmm. it's that generation that never talked about things and then being native and not having these opportunities for someone to help her. I now as a mother sympathize and yeah. I'm more empathetic in that way, because I'm like, she had 10 of us. So I'm the youngest of 10. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think back, I'm like, I have four and I am more forgiving now because I see how difficult life was. And I had postpartum and mm -hmm. I mean, I had a husband who was supportive. I had these resources to have to get through those like depression or things like that. And so, but one of the things that always stands up and stands in my mind or just motivates me is just how I want to be there with my, for my kids as a mother. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, my mother wasn't there for us a lot of times. And so maybe sometimes I'm overly like a protective mother, mama bear, but I'm always just making sure that they get what they need, that my schedule is the back of everything. Like they're in the forefront, always thinking what's for dinner, who needs to go here mm -hmm. and just loving on them. Like, mm -hmm. you know, just telling them I love them. And so those things are, I've really changed, uh, I think. And it's kind of become natural for me to do that because I didn't have that. And so those are some of the things that I try my best to be. I, I remember as a little girl thinking, I want to be the best mom ever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's my job. And mm -hmm. so I'm really thankful that we are have these beautiful four kids who are, are in our lives and that I am just so blessed to be their mom. So, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's, you know, that's and it. you know, it's not easy at times. It's hard, but somehow all that, sleepless nights and yeah. temper tantrums <laughs> you you really love these kids and you really yeah. can't you can't live your life you can't imagine living life without them uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. no I appreciate your again your vulnerability there and sharing yeah. and um my uh, grandma my mom's mom also had 10 kids and she was the second youngest and had a father who passed young and so mm -hmm. I, you know I've seen a lot of that firsthand right. the working through things and um it's tough so it's tough, yeah. sending you lots of love there because that it's it's hard yeah um 
Okay, so we talked earlier about uh, something that native women, uh, native woman running, uh, is focusing on right now. Uh, so for a list for the listeners who may not have been following along, unfortunately, this really has not been getting the media coverage yeah. it should be. Um, so for people right. who don't know what what is happening here, can you can you share with us? Yes. So in Canada and in the United States, um, in Canada they're called residential schools, and the United States they're called boarding schools. So in Canada, around like the late 1800s, I think 1860s, even back to like 1830s, recently until like 1996 in Canada, they've had they had these residential schools that were run by churches. The government allowed churches to control that, um, basically to simulate uh, Native kids, Indigenous kids into, you know, the white culture, religion. And so... Um, I think there was like over 80, I might be wrong, but 80 uh, residential schools in Canada. And so these kids were taken away from their homes like and taken away from their homes, forced by the government. And they were taken to uh, schools that would basically strip their culture away from them. One of their phrases is, um, say, kill the Indian, save the man. Mm. And so that's some of these kids would show up with, um, long hair that would be cut. They could not speak their language punishment. Uh, they, uh, just a lot of really horrible things of like, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, things like that happen. So that is in Canada and here in the United States, it's the boarding schools. And recently, uh, in Canada, they've been uh, finding unmarked, gra- unmarked mass graves of Indigenous children who never made it home, mm-hmm. whose parents probably never found out whatever happened to their child. And so now they're going through these schools, and now there's over uh, 1,600 uh, Indigenous uh, remains of Indigenous children that have been found. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's just, I think, seven, maybe five schools now. And so it's, it was one of those things where even though we have, you know, we're across, you know, Canada there and the United States, in our culture, n- Indigenous people, we are all related. Yeah. And so when I heard about this, I connected because we have uh, runners from Canada, Indigenous women runners. And so I reached out to them when I first heard the news. I said, hey, I just want to double check is this is what's really happening. And they're like, yes. And I said, what do you think if we if we run in honor of these children? And they said that would be great. And um, I just put it out there. We had just gotten done with our missing and murdered Indigenous woman like virtual run and so clearly after that like shortly after that it was like um the 215 children that were found in camp camp loops bc um and i just called it the 215 running in honor and so that has just keep it keeps going and it yeah. keeps increasing and so we've been running in honor of these children um and i think for us the community the built on native women running it's become a place of healing and just coming together. Um, especially one of the things that I mentioned, um, I think I did a video. When we see these indigenous kids, we see ourselves in them. And so I think that's what motivates a lot of us to do that. Mm-hmm. So, and today we just 160 were found in Vancouver Island at another residential school. And this is just the beginning and yes. it's going to keep going until every school and United States is start finally starting. But, you know, all this is I, I can't imagine uh, just how much these families who their child never came home mm-hmm. and how devastating it would be for them. So, yeah. So it's been really um, a thing that's brought our community together yeah. and just connections. I've made more connections in Canada with indigenous runners and I'm hoping to connect with them more uh, about doing a virtual event again. Mm-hmm. 
Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. I have been using Inside Tracker for years. I find it is really helpful for me keeping an eye on what is going on within my body, making sure that if I find out something is low from my blood work, the Inside Tracker gets done for me. I can then know that I need to work on that area, can make changes within my diet and uh, whatever else I can add in there. And then I can work to improve it. And then I can check back in and see what I'm doing. It's kind of like running, right? We like to have uh, something we need to improve, something we need to work towards and then get another check-in, see how we're doing and then try again, keep repeating that pattern and try and get closer and closer to ideal. Also, um, the way that things, you know, just happen sometimes in life that also applies to this as well. Sometimes our diets aren't as good. Sometimes we might be eating more of one thing and not another. Um, I love the inside tracker gives us the ability to get, get that check in. Um, and beyond that, if you do have a deficiency in something, if something is less than optimized, it will give you recommendations um, of foods that you can be eating to improve things. You can also add in whatever dietary restraints you have so that it can be tailored to you. It will give you the science that you need and it will show it all on this cool little graph of how you're doing over time as you continue to get those tests. Now, you as a Running For All listener can get yourself 25% off, 25% off Inside Tracker when you sign up. This is founded by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometric data. It's this ultra personalized performance platform like no other. Um, it's really easy for you to go sign up, uh, get your blood taken. They do all the work sending it off to Inside Tracker, getting it back to you um, and just letting you know when your results are in and then you can just check it in. It makes it so simple um, and there will be a facility near you where you can go get your blood drawn. And they're going to use that patented algorithm to analyze your body's data, provide you with a clear picture of what's going on inside you. And then they're going to give you those science-backed recommendations for positive changes you can make. And they'll give you a co concrete action plan. You can track your progress. And it is just a wonderful way to keep on, on top of what your body is doing, how it is doing on the inside. So you can go to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Tina to get yourself 25% off. I can't imagine uh, just how much these families who their child never came home mm -hmm. and how devastating it would be for them. So, yeah, so it's been really... Um, I think that's brought our community together yeah. and just connections. I've made more connections in Canada with indigenous runners and I'm hoping to connect with them more uh, about doing a virtual event again. So yeah, so that's what's been going on. Okay. So I will put a link in the show notes or lots of links so that if by the time this comes out, if there is anything you're doing or an event or a virtual run or something, then uh, people can participate and, you have information um, on how people can participate. So I'll put um, put that in there. And I want to, uh, I can't remember what I was watching or reading, but this isn't, you mentioned about US started. This isn't a thing exclusive in Canada, right? Like this no. is well known that uh, the assimilation, the stripping the, the Native American out of the person, leaving the white culture in there um, yeah. went on in the US pretty much from the get-go. Um, and so, yeah, maybe just talk to that a little bit um, as sometimes it can feel like a, not that people, you know, like we, I'm trying to think about how to explain this. Like it's very easy when you hear a big number to yeah. it not feel personal, you know, because you, it just is hard to picture. And especially when it's another country, you can almost like remove yourself from it because you're like, well, that doesn't happen here. Right, um, right. So just talk to that a little bit. Yeah. You know, it's, um, for instance, for me, I went to boarding school. I mean, here in the United States, I went several, t several, um, I think it was like first grade and then I left. And it, it, for me, it was more because our family situation, uh, mm -hmm. was tough. And so we went to boarding school. Um, I think the hardest part for me was separation. So you would basically, we would get there Sunday night and then someone would pick us up on Friday night. So we were there basically sleeping, eating at school. And so I think for people who've like, it's like generation 
uh, like a lot of like my mother was taken away to California when she was young. So it's this generational thing. And oftentimes people think, oh, that happened a long time ago. But here in the United States, the last boarding schools, I mean, they still kind of have boarding schools, but they're run by native people now. Um, it's it's a little bit different now, but like in here in the United States, it was like 1960s. And then in Canada, the last residential school was closed in 1996. Mm -hmm. So explaining to people that this is not like happened like thousands of years ago, like this is actually pretty recent. And a lot of the generation is like my mother went to boarding school or my brothers did, my siblings did. And it's this generational thing. And so for us, it just really it's really more personal to us as people. And so I try my best to, especially non-natives to explain that. And I've been really amazed how many non-natives have reached out to me and just really want to learn and just even saying, how, what can I do to help? Or just giving us that, uh, saying, Hey, I just, I'm thinking of you all, uh, how can I help you or what could we do to, and I think that's been really nice for people that we do have those people who truly care and want to know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's easier in the United States because things really are covered here. It's easy in the United States to just like, let's cover it up. Mm -hmm. But these are eventually going to come to light. And it is, I mean, there's a school in Pennsylvania, that's already had numbers. There's a school out in California where these numbers are actually coming up here in the United States, but it hits us differently as indigenous people because yeah. it's from generation. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really sad and it's kind of weighs on me. Like even me, cause like personally, I might not have known the indigenous kids in Canada, but it's kind of a weighing like, uh, exhaustion and yes. then, um, and like, how can I still be a leader for Native women running so that we can never forget um, honoring these children? Yeah. So I try my best to keep encouraging people to run or reaching out to people to you know do certain things or because we don't ever want to just put that in the back of our, OK, well, it's done. So it's really hard. Yeah. So I, that actually leads on to what I wanted to ask you, the final thing about you know, people think that someone like you or someone that is a leader in within whatever community it might be um, for an underrepresented group, that all you want to talk about is inclusion, that you must enjoy bringing this up uh, when that's <laughs> not the case. It's, right. As you said, it's exhausting. It takes a lot of heart, a lot of energy out of other things you could be spending your time and energy on. Right. Um, so what do you wish people knew in terms of that? And then, and then actually I'll ask the second one after you've answered that one. Um, yeah, I just, I think for me, it's just been one of those things where, um, I just want people to sit back and listen and yeah. just take it in. When I had the virtual run, you know, when the 215 kids happened, um, I put out people who were selling orange shirts, indigenous people who were, because they use the orange shirt there in Canada, which represents every child matters. And so non-natives were reaching out to me where they wanted to support that. And so, um, and I, I just, just listen and be there for us. And that really means a lot to us, especially, um, as an indigenous person. And I am a type of person that I'm all about allies. You know, if you're going to come beside us, I appreciate that so much. I never want to say, no, you can't. And it's amazing how many messages I do get because people who are non-native will say, is it okay if I wear the native woman running sweatshirt? <laughs> and I'm like, of course you can. I said, I'm all about allies. Or is it okay if we do the missing and murdered indigenous uh -huh. Virtual, right? I'm like, yes. I said, I'm all about allies. And I always try to make that important because that, because their voices matter too. And it, it helps us in these areas yes. that are very true to, to us and very heart to us, you know, that. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. Um, and, uh, just to, to wrap up here, you talked about, um, you know, wanting to show your kids, um, 
you know, how to, you want to show them love, you want to show them how to be strong, you want to be there for them in every way. And you said they're put first. And then you've also put all this first of um, some other relatives that um, are a country away, um, t- bringing up causes, talking about things, um, being a leader. How do you find time for, you know, where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah. How do you find time for self-care or do you? Well, and- that's a good question because my husband tells me, uh, you need to choose a day off. And I haven't been good at that. And he means, he means little off everything or yes, just like running? No, just like, you know, uh, just time where I'm not doing anything on Native I'm running, not doing any interviews, just having one day off where I could just think about myself. You know, like, and so that's been one of the things that I'm going to try to <laughs> implement in the fall, um, especially with my kids going back to school and things like that and doing a better job of just taking care of myself. But usually I think running has been my time alone, especially on Saturdays when I'm out there on the trails for six, five hours. I think that's been the time. And just taking those little moments of logging off earlier of a social media um, doing things that are fun for me, whether it's in the afternoon and uh, just taking that little coffee break. So yeah, I, that's been really hard. And I think it's just that mom thing where you mm-hmm. want to think like, even now this year, I'm thinking about races and stuff and my schedule, you know, I have certain races in mind, but the first thing that I have to do is check everybody's schedule. Cause I have mm-hmm. a senior in high school now checking everybody's schedule before I actually (laughs) sign up for a race or an event. So, um, so yeah, I'm hoping to do a better job of saying one day of this week saying, I'm not going to do anything with native women running or social media or my, even my personal, like logging off and just thinking about myself. And my husband is very good about telling me that every day. Well, last couple of weeks, months, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You got a, you got a good one there huh? yes. holding you to that. And, um, it is so interesting. Uh, you mentioned there about, you know, schedule picking races. Um, right. so I've had some opportunities come up, some races that I've potentially doing in the fall, but then, you know, it dawned on me that my husband is a college coach, so he okay. doesn't really have choice of when he travels. Like these yeah. meets are set. Yes. And then some of them are on the same weekend as something I might want to do. Right. And um, my family is stuck in England. I can't get them over here. Right. And so it's like, okay, you know, it's, it is interesting as a mother, you just, you, I mean, you have to put that first. Um, and yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's sad in some ways, but you know, you like to hope that someday when they're 35, they're going to come back to you and be like, mom, I really appreciate all the sacrifices you make. Like I see the decision you made here. At least that's what I hope. Anyway. Yeah. You know, one of the things, you know, I was a stay at home mom for like 14 years. So I put, I was a teacher. Then I became a mom and had four kids and I stayed at home for all of them. And, um, one of the things that my husband reminds me, especially, just everything that's been going on with running and native women running. Um, it's, it's, I've taken a lot of just my own career and putting it on hold. Absolutely. That now he's more, which, you know, he's always been great and supportive, but he's like, you need to think about yourself now. It's, it's your time. You deserve to go on this race. You deserve to do this because you sacrifice so much and, but still you feel guilty. Like, <laughs> yeah. <gonna> leave that. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. You never can have that balance. So <laughs> you'll, you'll get this. So last, uh, Sunday, yeah. my, uh, one-year-old fell asleep for two and a half hours and my three-year-old was at a friend's house the whole morning. Yeah. And so I was like, Oh, I've got some time. And I was like, what should I do? And then I was like, I know, I'll bake some superhero muffins and sweet potato cookies. And, Uh and like, even that time I couldn't just use it on reading a book or sitting outside. I was like, well, I'm going to do something I've been meaning to do that I can give my family for when we're hungry. And, and so like, (laughs) even with that, and the funniest thing is when that time was over and like that two and a half hours was up, I was like, Oh, I feel so good having got that done. Yeah. 
And, but I was like, but at the end of the day, I still wasn't switched off. I was still doing something for my family. Um, exactly. <laughs> and myself, I suppose. I, I eat the food too, but um, oh yeah. yeah, it's just funny with mothers. You're always, uh, always putting other people first. Um, exactly. Even if you think you might be doing it for you, you're not really. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, speaking of things you have coming up, what, tell us just to round out here, what do you have coming up so we can go support you? Yeah. So um, just individually like races or mm-hmm. yeah, yeah we'll so both. I'm, I'm running the, the Havelina 100, I guess mm. that's how you say it, the 100K uh, Halloween weekend. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking of doing that race. Um, I potentially might be doing Boston for charity for Wings of America. Right. Uh, so that is, uh, I was supposed to do it uh, 2020, but then all that stuff happened with, and I'm hoping to do a, I think it's Black Canyon Ultra, I think a 40K in February. Right. Hopefully that works out because it'll be really cold here in Minnesota and I'll be like, oh, I'm going to go to Arizona. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Get a little break. <laughs> so far, that's it. I just, one of the things too is I just have to really watch, I think, with my knee, mm. how many races I do mm. and trying to, uh, granted, I don't do a lot of races, but um, just being uh, careful what I choose uh, and just thinking about my health is, is really what I need to think about too. So just trying to find things that, I can do and, um, that'll just work with my schedule. So, yeah. uh, so yeah, that's potentially what's coming up. So I'm mm-hmm. basically now training for the 100 K. Great. So exciting. And, and where can people find out more about you follow along with native woman running? Yes. Yeah, so native I, my woman personal running. account is Hajon, which is H O Z H O runner number four. Um, Hajon actually means, in Navajo, like you find balance in life, you know, harmony. So that's kind of how my, I oh. kind of plug in my little Navajo culture there. Um, Native Woman Running, yes, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So yeah, so that's, those are the four accounts. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's enough. Yeah. Uh, and I put lots of links in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today, uh, for being vulnerable, for sharing your big heart. And uh, I look forward to seeing how the community supports you in the future. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Before we end this episode, I just want to take a moment to shout out my podcast editor, Jeremy Nessel, who has done such a wonderful job of looking after my podcast, taking out all the mis- mishaps in the episodes, while still keeping in the the vulnerability and the realness and the rawness of the conversation. This is not one of those podcasts where I take out the ums and the ers and the the sometimes the delay in in words because I think it's very important to keep that authenticity we're surrounded by perfected and manicured everything and I think it's really important that running for real stays that way so thank you to Jeremy for your work I also want to thank Maria Vargas and Amber Moore who are also part of my team they've been a big part of this community and me being able to build this brand so just want to give them a shout out too all right let's get right back to the end of this episode Thank you to Vanna for joining us today on the Running For All podcast. I really enjoyed getting to know her more. I appreciate that vulnerability that she shows. And I think she has a lot to offer the rest of the running community, a lot we can all learn from. And I just appreciate her activism that she does. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors today. That is Tracksmith. You can get $15 off your order of $75 or more. Be sure to go check out that Cannonball series that you can use as a... Um, swimming or running um, item. So that works out really nicely in the summer months. Uh, You can go to uh, tracksmith.com and use code TINA15 to get that special offer. You can also go to youcan.co to get yourself a 20% off your order at UCAN. Um, I am really loving the salted peanut bars right now. I can uh, not go through, through those fast enough, slow enough. I'm going through those too fast, basically. They're really good. I take them on my trail runs. Um, you can use code Tina. You can to get 20% off your order there. And thank you to Inside Tracker. Uh, Inside Tracker helps me keep an eye on how my body is looking from the inside, getting that blood work done regularly to see how I am doing, and also to keep on improving my health, making those right steps. You can go to insidetracker.com forward slash Tina Muir. That's T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R. And you will get yourself uh, 25% off their order if you go to insidetracker.com forward slash, actually it's Tina. 
insidetracker.com forward slash Tina, even easier for you to get yourself 25% off your order. Thank you to our sponsors for today. Thank you to Verna for joining us today. Go support her. Go do what you what you need to do. Check out those links in the show notes. Be sure to subscribe as a birthday gift for me and a um, review. I appreciate you and I'll see you on Monday for another Together Run.